But what was so interesting was I had severe postpartum after I had my first son. I started working at Create and Cultivate when my son was seven weeks old. Mm -hmm. Two days after working, I stopped crying. Mm. I was able to do what I'm really good at doing at work. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, I was able to go home and be a better mother to my son. All I see is blessings on blessings, yeah. I see the blessings coming our way, our way, our way. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, in the house, we have the one, the only, I'm gonna do a proper intro for her because she deserves all the intro, but we have <laughs> Neha Kumar in the house. And I just wanna tell you, I'm so excited that I have you here with me, IRL, in real life. Um, and I'm just gonna tell a quick backstory of why I'm so excited to have you here. Because before I even started this podcast, it was a thought, a little pebble in my brain. And sometimes we all have that. Here at The Cool Mom Code, we are all about, you know, mothers is the through line, but our whole vibe is to make sure that mothers know that they are not only mothers, that they are other things too. And that's our whole vibe is to inspire, aspire, like everything because we want mothers to have a full life and remember who they are and where they came from. So it was a little pebble in my brain, guys. And I went to this dinner and I met Neha and I was just like floored because not only was she so interesting, um, we just connected and I really do. I really think that, you know, in life you meet certain people and you instantly connect. And that was the feeling I had with you. I felt like I'd known you for years and years and I'd only met you for five minutes. And so we started talking and we started talking about podcasting and all these things. And she was like, do it, do it. You have to do it. You have to do it. <laughs> That's okay. You have to pause. It's fine. Like you have to do it. You have to do it. And so um, that was like the pebble. And I think, you know, we've had conversations and like, you know, you've been so instrumental in just like giving me even just the confidence to move forward on certain things. And this was one of them. And so I'm so excited to talk about it with you as a pebble and now have you here on the actual podcast yeah, it's telling amazing. your story. Like this is so cool. That is so cool. Um, so you are a mom of two, but like before we like jump jump into all that, I like to start a little bit more in like the beginning of your story because although you are a mom, it's not the only thing and it took you a journey to get to where you are. And so I just always like to kind of remind people that it takes a minute, right? Like it takes a journey for you to even show up here who you are in your full self. And so where are you from? And tell me a little bit about how you, um, I guess there's so many things because you have such a full story. But like, tell me where you're from. Let's start there. Of course. So I'm originally from Orange County. My parents were from India. I am a typical product of immigration, yes. right? So my parents came here. They were arranged marriage. Wow. And, you know, my dad came here with very, very little money. It's almost textbook immigrant story. Mm -hmm. He came here and his first job you know, was washing dishes in the back of a restaurant. Wow. And he came here from one of the top universities, India, and people didn't really give credit to his education because mm -hmm. it was a different time. Right. And he got fired from his first job in three days. Wow. And he had read this book, right? It was by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh-huh. And in the book, it said, dress for the job that you want. So he wore a suit <gasps> for three days That's going amazing. in to wash dishes. That's and amazing. on the third job, third day, they fired him because they said, listen, you're not going to stay at this job. Mm -hmm. And so it's pure immigration, like a pure product of immigration. And it's really seeing, you know, it's it was so interesting growing up and seeing my parents, how hard they work to give me and I have a younger sister a, a life, a certain life, give us a certain education level. And I really think that that type of mentality has what's been there to really help me be successful and me be the person that I am today. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that success, right? That you've, you've had over your journey. You are extremely smart, maybe one of the smartest women I know. Um, and I just think it's so cool that you've been so open and honest about being a woman in, in leadership in the room. 
you know, in the room full of men at times and kind of like having that voice. Tell me about that. Tell me about how it was um, in school in a place where, you know, women aren't necessarily celebrated for being that smart in those in those circumstances and in those rooms. So talk to me about like your journey through school and like what that looked like for you. No, absolutely. And it's it's an interesting time. I think just in history to be having these types of conversations as well. And I think one of the most amazing things is that there is a lot of awareness around this and there's a conversation that's there. For me in school, it was it was challenging, yeah. right? Um, when I would try to do hard and, and study a lot, I was there were a lot of nicknames that were given to me as all kids have though, mm-hmm. right? And my nickname was nerdy Neha in high mm. school and and it was really tough and I think I went into finance and accounting and I I know a huge part of the reason that I went into it is because I thought that that's what's going to give me credibility mm-hmm. that's what's going to help me stand up and say you know what I can I can do things and I can do things that a lot of people wouldn't think that I can do and I do know a lot of that mentality comes from my parents right because it's you're constantly faced in life with you can't do this And my parents always joke around and they say to me, you know, Neha, you were always the little girl who would say ever since you were two or three years old, I'll show you. Oh, I love that. I love it. You knew from the beginning. You knew from a little one that, wow, I love that. That's confidence. It is. And it takes time to cultivate and grow that confidence. And there's a lot of times with confidence, it does get broken down as well. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of times throughout my journey, you asked about high school and everything else down that road. There were a lot of times through my journey where I had that confidence broken Mm -hmm. and it's just like a muscle, right? And so if you want to become stronger, you break down the muscle, you go to the gym and you do things. And so for me, it was very similar. It was constantly breaking it down, but then you find the right nutrients, things Mm -hmm. that you can do just like building muscle. Mm -hmm. And I found that in the support of a lot of people around me. And some of the biggest support that I got were from other women. Mm. And that wasn't always common in my time, especially growing up. When I was in banking, I was very fortunate. I had two women that were some of the hugest supporters for me. Mm-hmm. One person was actually my credit training coach. Wow. And it was phenomenal because I was with all men all the time. Um, I was a woman of color, which was very different. Mm-hmm. And she was as well. And here's what's really interesting about this is A lot of women that I would see at the time, and we still see that today, is for better or for worse, they have to sit there and take care of themselves. This person was a person who bend over backwards to not only just be successful themselves, but they would take the time to educate and coach me in how I can succeed. That's amazing. That's amazing. It's so hard to find people like that. It's phenomenal because you're right. When I talk to especially successful women, they've had so many experiences of the exact opposite. They've had so many experiences where when they were young, they were learning, women were not their supporters in the room. Especially in places like, you know, mind you, I come from a very much an entertainment background. So I've never had to, and I will say that, I I had a model on recently and her and I had a lot of these discussions as well, even just like women competing with women in the entertainment industry and like the modeling industry. Um, But in a world such as finance, right, or in these more corporate kind of situations, I've heard so many women say the exact opposite where women have had to protect themselves appear to have the same mentality as a male counterpart in the room and not give back necessarily to the young women who are coming up and also shame them, you know, in the same room. And so that's so, I I mean, obviously now we look at it and we're like, oh my God, they did what? You know, but at the time you're right, it was a timing thing. And I think you know, having like so many voices now where women are like speaking out and like it's all like the hashtag is like women helping women, support women, you know, that kind of thing. I think it's inspiring for the women that we're raising, right? You know, so that's really is. And I think one thing just to point out too is that there's always going to be women there that are are not going to be as supportive. I had more than my fair share than I would ever like to admit that Mm -hmm. were there. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important for us to hold on to the ones that do support us Mm -hmm. and then in turn to return that support in any way, shape or form that we can. You know, I have a a daughter now, one and a half year old. I want 
it makes me more motivated to go out there and help other women because I know that it's a domino effect. They'll help other women. They'll help someone else. One day, maybe one of those people will help my baby. That's doll. right. So what do you, what do you, what will you say to your daughter, to the haters out there, the ones who don't help her, the ones who are like in her yep. way instead of helping her? I love this. It, I would tell her to cut out the noise, mm. trim out the noise, because no matter what you're doing in life, there's always all of this excess noise around you. And you almost have to become to a certain extent myopic in scope and now mm. i know that phrase has a lot of negative negativity associated with it right. but you kind of have to mm -hmm. because you want to make sure that you're focusing in just on what is important narrow the field there you go narrow the field right like people in sports always give me these yep. analogies and my husband is like a big sports guy i love sports <laughs> analogies they're so good you know what you should talk to him then they're so good every time i'm looking at him like cross-eyed like sideways like okay i get it but it's true it's like you know they always say sports are like you know know the world and like you know it, it is you have to narrow <laughs> the field the the, yeah. the quarterback has to narrow in on the field he has to see everything that's going on and narrow in on where he's trying to go yeah. and throw that ball and so it's kind of like that same philosophy but you know it's interesting I always think about this and as we give great advice because I think you give great advice I've been told I give really good advice too but I think as we give such great advice to our to our daughters and what we would tell them we need to take it for ourselves yeah and I think sometimes that's what we forget to do as women and as mothers um, but we forget to take the advice for ourselves yeah I completely hear that and that's so many moms that I talk to they constantly get caught up with mom guilt yes yes and you do have to take care of yourself and taking care of yourself is one of the most important things mm -hmm. it really is you can be a better mother when you're taking care of yourself. Now, when I met you the first time, I was telling you too, like I started my job at Create and Cultivate when my son was seven weeks old. Right. And I dealt with major postpartum depression um, after I had my first child. And the interesting thing about postpartum is if you would have told me about postpartum years ago, I would have said, just push through it. Mm -hmm. It's no big deal if you're well, a strong if, person. If, you, if I would have told you about it before kids? Before I had my postpartum. Wow. Right, because I thought it was something, I'm a type A personality, I work in finance, I'm, I'm very structured. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would have thought it's something you can push through. It isn't. No. It is a medical condition and it is not something you have a choice about. Right. So I didn't understand it. But what was so interesting was I had severe postpartum after I had my first son. I started working at Create and Cultivate when my son was seven weeks old. Mm -hmm two days after working, I stopped crying. Mm. I was able to do what I'm really good at doing at work. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, I was able to go home and be a better mother to my son. That is powerful. Pause on that right there. Pause on that moment, right? You're saying that postpartum was so severe for you. You felt it so strongly after the birth of your first son. And as immediately as you, after you went back to work, you felt better about who you were. And I think that's such a powerful statement because I know for me, with my first, I was all in. I had miscarried before I had my first um, daughter and I knew in my mind, I was like, okay, I'm going all in on motherhood. I am like right there. And honestly, I mean, I feel like I lost myself for like, not lost myself. Let me not say that. I enjoyed motherhood. However, I think I forgot a little bit about who I was and what made me happy as a whole person for about two years. And so I don't necessarily think it was postpartum per se, um, but I will say that I lost a little bit of me yeah. in that process of becoming yeah. a mother. And I just think it's amazing that you're saying, give light, shed light on the fact that some women do enjoy still doing things yeah. outside of the home and that brings them joy. You know, And so you're like, I love the fact that you took that moment and that you actually made the choice to even go back to work. Yeah, and I had, a, I had a lot of people who were telling me, what are you doing? Ugh. What are you doing? How could this happen? I had family members tell me, you have a baby, and my husband travels for work. Right. So it was, 
you have a baby at home. How could you leave this baby at home? And I said, what, like, what about me? Right. Right. Like, I want to go to work. Yeah. I worked. I was somebody's baby, too. That's right. I That's had right. hopes and dreams and, <laughs> you know, right. people had hopes and dreams for me of all the great things I was going to do in the world yes. and what I was going to become. And does that just go out the window because I had a child? I was somebody's baby, too. That is so <laughs> true. It just always resonates in my mind because we keep we have a child and it's the new and shiny thing in the world. But right. I mean, what about me? Well, Where did know, I go? My philosophy on it all is that, listen, I'm raising a human. If you want this human to be a thriving person in this world, then they're going to have to see the whole me of what makes me happy. So I was at a dinner. I love that. I love that. I was at a dinner recently and I was talking to a mother who was sitting across from me and she was saying that her mother, while she was being raised the whole time, would say, you are my greatest gift because you're my child. You were the best thing that I ever did. However, you are not the only thing that I did. And she was like, her mother I mean, was, that was everything. I was like, girl. So good. Can Free. we put that it was on so a, good. Put it on a t-shirt. Yeah. I mean, wear it out. Like, it's just, it was so mind blowing to me. It was like what Oprah calls the aha moment, right? Yeah. It was like, that's exactly what it is. You are, the, my children are the best thing that I've done. However, they're not and will not be the only, the only things thing. that I do. And so that was like, that's exactly what Cool Mom Co. is about. It's just about having that full life, right? And that does not mean that, you know, stay at home moms or however you decide to mother, working yep. mothers, stay at home mothers, um, part time mothers, what, however it is or whatever your situation is. The beauty in it is that you're making space for yourself yep. as well as your children. And so that's that's what we're that's what this is all about. Right? I love it. I just love it. And when I had my daughter, uh, we were going through the sale of the company at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember because the big thing that a lot of people want to talk about, right, is motherhood and entrepreneurship. Right. And a daughter and, was two years after your son. Yeah. So now you have your son. You're created. You're you're on board with Create Cultivate seven weeks after he's born. So you're in it. Like you're yep. mothering. You're careering. You're doing all the in things. Yeah. And now two years later, you're in the sale of the company. And I was pregnant. And you were pregnant. <laughs> and I literally went into early labor during a three hour diligence call that was on Zoom. Wow. I mean, it was it was an adventure. But I mean, here's the thing is that I I gave birth to her in the process of the sale mm -hmm. and I didn't take off a day for maternity leave. Wow. And I had so many people tell me as particular family members said to me, too, they said, listen, they should give you time off. Mm. They should make sure that you can take care of your baby. They should do this. They should do that. And I said to her, listen, I am the they. <laughs> there's no there's no other right. they. Right. 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 And when you're if you're working at a startup, you have your own business, you're doing it. That's just that's how this world is and that's what you gotta do. But here's what's amazing. My husband works at a large company mm -hmm. and he took off nine weeks of paternity leave. I love that. And what I love about that is we live in a world and we're, we're going more towards that where when you have women at the table, and mm -hmm. I know you and I have talked about this a few times now, right. but when you have a woman who have a seat at the table, mm -hmm. that perspective and that mentality now permeates throughout an organization. It's a trickle effect or right. a domino effect or a combination right. of both. So when my husband took nine weeks off paternity leave, which is the only way we can make it all work, mm -hmm. no one batted an eyelash at no, his work. No, not at all, not at all. Because it is a two people thing. It mm -hmm. isn't just a mom has to do something or a dad has to do something. Let me tell you. So this is really great that we're moving into this part of the conversation because once again, we had another mom on the podcast um, and she was basically explaining that in her household she feels like if she's going to be breastfeeding there has to be something that he does only exclusively so her whole thing was if I'm going to be breastfeeding then he exclusively has to change diapers I don't want to see a diaper I don't want to change a diaper I don't want to look at a diaper I don't want to have to order diapers I don't want anything to do with a diaper and it was interesting like her perspective on it was just that like okay if I'm the mom we all have then you're the dad it takes two yeah and if we're in a household if we're lucky enough to be in a household where there are two parents involved, yeah. then we both have to play a part in this whole baby thing. Since we were baby making, I know. we got to play a part. It in took this two people thing. to make that's, the baby. That's so right. That's right. And I just loved that. But like going back to the whole thing of what you were saying about like being, you are the they. 
You are the they. I think that there's so, right now, and maybe this is just the place in life where I am, where I my eyes are wide open, like I see it everywhere. There are so many female founders. Right now, I mean, I see it everywhere. I feel so inspired by so many women I meet who are just, they are driven, they are successful in, in so many different ways. Um, and, and women are really saying right now, hey, there's something I wanna do and I'm gonna take the steps necessary to make it happen. I'm gonna start that thing that I thought was just something I was good at or whatever. I'm gonna do this, I have an idea, I'm gonna make it happen. And there's so many female founders that they are the they, right? They are the top of their food chain. Yeah. They are the ones who are making the rules. Do you, and it is hard to take that time off when you have those transitions in life, like a baby, a new baby yeah. and things like that. Um, and I felt the same way when I had my second because I was in it. And so I was like, oh, I didn't have time to take off. I remember having my second and then going on and doing, um, I, did a, I did a live segment. I was hosting a live segment, I don't know, maybe like three weeks after. And I was like, in my mind, it was just something, I, it was so natural, but I was like, everyone was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know, I'm working. Opportunity came, I took it. I yeah. don't know what you want me to say. Like, you know, I, yeah. I, I have to figure this out. But do you wish that you did take time or no, in hindsight? I love this question because if people need to take time to bond with their baby and do it, I respect that completely. Mm -hmm. And I know that that is a lot of the mentality that's out there. But if you don't want to, or you have other things that are coming your way, there's nothing wrong if it looks different for you. It right. looks, it's gonna look the way that you want it to look and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I had been wanting to get that bad. So I teach um, entrepreneurship classes, right? right? And I needed and wanted that badge of taking a company through a transaction, mm. doing it, making it happen, closing it. Right. That was important for me in my career, not just something for the short term, but something I've been working on for such a long time and was going to make a big impact for mm -hmm. me. The opportunity presented itself. Right. Now, was it the ideal time? I don't know. <laughs> right. You know, but I'm so I feel victorious. Yes. Like I am absolutely going to tell my daughter what I got to do with her. And the photo that came out on Forbes of the, my partner and I uh -huh. on the sale of the company, sometimes I would look at that photo and I would say, oh, I don't look so good in that photo. I'm this, that. And I remember showing it to my OBGYN and he said, oh, Ava's in the photo with you. <gasps> I because I was 30 plus weeks pregnant. Wow. And now when I look at that photo, it's amazing. She was with me during the process mm -hmm. of me selling the company and doing something that was so important to me. And I happened to have a girl. Right. I can't look at that as something that's anything more than magical. Agreed. So your question, right, do I wish I would have done something different? I think it was perfect. I love that. I love that. I love it because, you know, I love it not necessarily because you decided to work through and push through and all those things. I love it because you were true to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I love it because you were true to yourself. And I think that if every woman out there was always just true to herself and we could kind of bring down a little bit of that um, mom judgment that I'm sure floats around and that we all yeah. feel, you know, at times. I think if we bring that down a little bit, a couple notches and like every mom just being true to herself, then I think, wow, um, imagine, imagine the things that mothers, women would be like doing right now. Oh my God. It's it wild. Be, it's it's some, wild. It'd be amazing. Just amazing. Like just think of now my daughter's going to hear all these stories exactly. and everything. Think of what that's going to do for her. I will tell you that it took, I've always been a confident person. I've always been very comfortable in my skin, very comfortable in like, you know, my choices. But I will say that as a mother, I think I became fearless. If that makes any sense. I don't think I was fearless before. Yeah. I think I took risks, calculated risks, yeah. at certain moments yeah. of life. And I think that I was always confident and comfortable, although I was even just becoming a woman and still like, you know, you go through your ups and downs and all that stuff. But becoming a mother made me look at life and I was like, if I could do this, let me tell you, I could do anything. Yeah. It just gave me like this like 
like oomph to my yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And I yeah. don't know. I think it's just because you know the responsibility of literally raising a whole yeah. new human. If you can do that and keep yeah. that one alive, then no no in the world means anything to you. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm the first thing that happened for me that really it, I got okay, I used to be deathly scared of spiders. Oh. Right? <laughs> deathly scared of spiders. You sound like my husband. De- <laughs> <laughs> it's too funny. So, and my husband would travel for work all the time. So if there was a spider, I remember one time there was a spider, like a big one. I found like a big container, put it on there, and then I waited a couple of days till he came no. home to take it. No joke. No. no joke, right? But as soon as I had a kid, you think of your child when you put the swaddles on them. That's right. They're in a straight jacket. Mm-hmm. So like if a spider were to come near their face, like they can't even swat it away. <laughs> I got so good at Ooh. taking down spiders. Like I am vicious now, right? But it's it's so that's a small thing, right? right? And in the grand scheme of things, but the confidence it gives you because you end up yourself also. It comes back to tuning out the noise, mm-hmm. right? And you just the things that weren't that important, mm-hmm. you start to swat them away. That's right, right? Because you know now there's things that are so much more important that you need to take care of and that you're responsible for. Mm-hmm. And when you now look at the world through that lens, it's amazing what you can make happen because. Mm-hmm moms are phenomenal the amount of stuff that they can handle like phenomenal it's something else but you think about it right you have various different entrepreneurs different types of jobs and careers and all these things that people can do while handling all of this Mm -hmm. like it's it's something else it's something else i mean i literally think back to it now as a mother when i became a mom and i really got into it first thing i did was call my mama i was like mom <laughs> <laughs> let me just take a moment to tell you how amazing you are right because i don't know how you did it. and my mom was a single mom of three kids oh my gosh and i was just like in hindsight i'm like girl how, how did you do it how and i know listen i've always said this and i will continue to preach it from the mountaintops i feel very blessed to be in a marriage and a situation in a relationship where I feel like we're both um, co-partners in yeah. parenting. And so I feel like I ha- it's not all on me. And, and I feel like I have that support system within our household. But I promise you, I will shout it from every rooftop, single mothers and single parents, really, because now, you know, yep. I, th- there are a lot of single dads out there, too, mm-hmm. who are doing it. But single parents, period. Wow. Just wow. They are literally the strongest human beings on earth. I, I, I can't say it enough because to parent alone, even with someone else in the house, yeah. is a lot. But to it do is. it on your own, wow. But I called my mama. I was like, mom, 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 I love you. I love to tell you how much I love you. Because it's just, you, you, don't be, you don't realize how overwhelming sometimes it can be. Yeah. You know? That's amazing. A single mom with three kids. I don't even... I can't even fathom. But did you feel like that as a new mom? Were you like, yeah, I did. Wow. I still wow. do with my mom <laughs> because I'll take one of my kids somewhere and I'm like, I can do one kid <laughs> at a time. And my mom, my mom had me when she was 21. Mm-hmm. And then we had another, she had another kid three years after. And she would take both of us on trips to India. Wow. There were no cell phones, nothing at the time, both of us. I, mm-hmm. I don't know how she did it at all. But you know, for a period of time before COVID, right, I had uh, my son at home and it was just me and him. Mm -hmm. My husband was always traveling and I'm so fortunate. He was there on the weekend and I had the support of him. But on the weekdays, every once in a while, I would feel it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Even if I had somebody else there for five minutes, for five minutes to hold him so I could go to the bathroom I mean, God forbid I could wash my hair. Mm-hmm. Dry shampoo was like my best friend, mm-hmm. right? It would have made such a big difference. And I'm very fortunate that, again, I had him on the weekends and I still knew he was coming. But it just gave me a glimpse into what it could be like for people who were both the parents have to work. That's right so intensely or you know you're a single parent Mm -hmm. it's amazing and i don't think anyone truly understands what it is like to be a parent or can even have an idea until you get thrown into it girl let me tell you there's no handbook 
There is no like. Listen, when they hand that baby to you at the yeah. hospital, or if you have a home birth or whatever it is, there's nothing that comes with them. There's no handbook that says, "Let me just tell you, here's all the ins yeah. and outs you need to know." It's a learning process, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it can be. I, th- I personally think that's why uh, it takes a village is so important. It does. Because it really does take a village. For for me, I felt like um, like most of our family wasn't in LA, and so for a long time, my husband and I were really like doing a juggle ourselves and back and forth and and it was you know it was hard to find your village right but we had to really like find and create and create right the people around us who we could bring into our lives to just kind of help and now in my life more than ever I feel like I've finally created or found what that village looks like but I think that's the biggest thing through parenthood finding your village find the people who you know you can lean on because you have to be okay leaning somewhere yeah. Right? Like, to you put do. it all on your shoulders is the hardest part. It really is. It truly, truly is. It takes so many people to work through it. And I really believe in creating life teams. Right. Right? You have a support network of people that are around you. And yes, maybe a certain person isn't perfect or a certain family member. We all have them, right? They only <laughs> want to do all. certain parts. Don't we all? You know, but it's knowing that each person has their role to play and mm-hmm. each person can contribute. And it's, it's almost like sports right so if we're looking at it even if you're looking at a soccer team right you're gonna have the main player you're gonna have the striker you're gonna have certain people who have certain positions Mm -hmm. but you need everyone to actually play the game that's right and that's how it is when you're having a child as well everyone has their own role to play and i think a lot of us can be so quick to get upset with those family members, mm-hmm. right? But we got to remember, everyone has a part to play. Everyone has a part to play. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, this is, I feel like, the hard part of it sometimes. Like, for me, you know, before having my first, I miscarried. And yeah. it was extremely difficult for me. I remember um, calling my grandmother, who uh, was alive at the time, and I remember just being on the phone with her, bawling 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 and she's she used to live in Michigan she was in Michigan and I was in LA um, and I felt so alone out here it was me and my husband I felt so alone but um, I remember calling her crying 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 and she said to me she said Lizzie you come from good stock you will have healthy babies i promise you you will have healthy babies and three months before she passed i had nima my oldest and i remember feeling like wow what a blessing that i was able to have this baby before my um, obviously unbeknownst to me i didn't know that my so before my grandma passed and i just i recall that memory so vividly because it was just so important to me but i know that your journey into motherhood wasn't an easy one either Tell me about it. Tell me a little bit about it and and what your, I don't know, what your experience was with it. Absolutely. My first child was a colic baby. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that meant until way later. But essentially, he cries all the time. Mm -hmm. And this lasted for months. Wow. My husband wasn't there. It was very hard. Um, I'm sure that added in some degree to the postpartum as well, but it was very, very hard. Also, I thought that I was so tough, I don't need medication. Mm. And I thought I could push through it and I could make things happen. Now, that was my first baby. I had a second pregnancy Mm -hmm. after that. And my second pregnancy was the hardest thing I've ever had to go through in my life. And I do hope it'll, it'll stay that way, that that was the hardest thing. But we found out with my second child, there's um, a test that you do at 12 weeks, Mm -hmm. and it's the NIPT test, the blood test. And you find out if there's any genetic disorders or anything that are associated with it. And that happens at 12 weeks, Mm -hmm. right? And so we did it during the holidays because that's when we were pregnant. Um, And you also find out the sex of the baby, it was a boy. Mm. And we found out at that time that there was a high probability that he has a genetic defect, which it's an extra chromosome, which is considered by the medical community as an unviable pregnancy. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that there's gonna be hardships for the child or anything else. It's actually not deemed a pregnancy. Right. And so what's so interesting is that then 
you know, after that, we basically had to go through and do additional testing because we wanted to make sure. Of course. And so by the time that happened, just to give you a little bit of a timeline, it was week 12, 13. Mm -hmm. We did the amniocentesis. We got confirmation around week 14, 15, and it was during the holiday time. So all the labs, everything was closed, everything was delayed. So around week 15 or so, we did terminate the pregnancy after we got confirmation. Mm -hmm. What's so hard for me about all of that especially just given what's occurred the past so many months of here course, of course is you know i didn't even know that that was an abortion mm. when i would read all the paperwork and everything else it's called a dnc and from, from the doctors from the medical community they never used read. the word abortion right it was called a dnc which you know is a termination of the pregnancy but in my mind the word abortion always had something that had a negative connotation associated with it right and this to me was the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. And I just don't know if there's enough of an understanding that people also have and what's all involved, mm -hmm. right? I understand there's certain time periods now where, you know, the laws in certain places will state that, you know, up until this point in time, it's, you can terminate the pregnancy or an abortion, right? Um, we wanted this baby. Right, right. And we did what we thought was best. Mm -hmm. I did what I thought was best. As I had to sign all the paperwork, everything else to protect my child. Mm -hmm. Because everything we, everyone, every doctor we talked to, we had multiple, you know, we went and got multiple um, opinions. Opinions, thank you. Mm -hmm. And it was this child isn't going to make it. And well, it's, it's just also, going to suffer. It's also protecting your life. You know, because a lot of the stories we've heard, studies that we've we've read, right, is that a lot of times even just having an unviable pregnancy within you for a long period of time and waiting for it to naturally come out itself is sometimes harmful for the mother and can cause a lot of harm for even just the woman caring. And it's so interesting because a lot of people don't really understand that. Mm -hmm. And I had been given that information multiple times by multiple doctors and it could, in today's age, at least, it's not necessary that it's going to impact, like it's gonna terminate my life, mm -hmm. but it could prohibit me from having another child as right. well. Right. And it can have a lot of medical complexities for me. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting that no one really thinks about or looks at those things. That's right. And honestly, I might not have my perfect, beautiful baby girl right now if it wasn't for that at that time did we want to keep my son? 100% we did. Right, of course. I mean, I just think it's so interesting with Roe versus Wade now, right? And it being recently overturned that now we are forcing women to make the decision. In your case, let's just say, since yeah. we just talked about it. In your case, we're forcing you to now not even have a choice between saving I won't even make it as grave as saving your own life, but let's say making sure that you are a healthy functioning human being for your and a mother for your current son who is alive yeah. and, and well and, and doing all these things, right? For that child, yeah. for you to be a functioning, healthy mother in society for that child. Now we're asking, not even asking, we're telling you that yeah. you don't even have the choice now with a pregnancy that you're that is deemed unviable by the medical community. Not yeah. that you thought, not that, not even, not even. Even yeah, that you didn't want the baby, wanted the baby, healthy baby, you want all that. But I think now we're forcing women into these certain situations and that breaks our heart. It just breaks our heart because it's, it's allowing the mother not to have a choice. It's wild to me. Mm -hmm. It really, really is. Like I would like to think that everything in life has two sides and we might be biased on a certain side I struggle right now to understand. I really struggle, Lizzie, to understand the other side to this. Same. I I actually don't understand the other side, mm -hmm. even if I want to give it the benefit of the doubt. I wanted the child, and at, the thing is, is that every there's there's a different story for everybody. I was at, gonna say this same was thing. my story, right. but everyone has their own story, mm -hmm. and we also need to keep in mind the mother. Mm -hmm. The Agreed. woman, the girl, like we were talking about earlier, she's also somebody else's baby. That's right. That's right. And she has a life that we need to protect mm -hmm. and that we need to nurture and that we need to grow. Mm -hmm. 
It's it's so true. You know, um, I've I've obviously have many opinions on this, but you know, I've also um, I write for uh, an article, and um, one of the articles I just wrote was a piece on Black maternal health. And for me, I feel like this is something very similar, right? Like in our, you know, country today, black maternal health, it's a crisis. There's the rate in which we are dying as black women on the table in childbirth and through labor is... It's like 50% higher. This, this is my, you know, my producer over here talking to me on the side. But this is 50% higher than non black women or even women of color color, right um in general and so that stat alone is just shocking to me it's shocking to me so i feel like it's it's so interesting you know how they correlate we're taking away the right for women to choose but yet we're not also protecting them when they have to go there and and give birth and go through the laboring process and all these things. So we're not protecting them and we're taking away their right to choose. It's, it just feels so backwards to me and it feels so, um, it backwards. Just, it feels backwards, and it just feels like, you know what it feels like? It feels like the life of women isn't being protected. And now we're in a place where we just feel like we're not even protected. So we get paid less. <laughs> <laughs> we're not protected. We're 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 expected. We're the only beings who can procreate and like you know what I mean, like have life and give life and like yeah. all these things. It's like there's just so many. I don't know. It just for me, I think in a time right now, how, I'm gonna bring this back to you because in a time right now, when you and I are both raising daughters, what are you? How do you? She's not old enough yet. How are you going to explain this time to her, or what? What are you teaching her um, to have this, the tools necessary to navigate a world and a future like that? Honestly, I'll rewind just a little bit and then I'll answer your question. But I still just all of this just doesn't even make any sense to me at all, right? And even when you look at, even when you look at right now the world where certain states are saying will help you travel and go to other places and everything else to get it done. I just, I was working at a company at the time. I, so I went on a, it was a Thursday. I'll never forget. It was January 2nd and Thursday I went to work for half the day and then I left work and I got it done. And then Friday I took the day off and I was back at the office on Monday. I was working at a company that supports women. That's Mm -hmm. there for women. I was working in an environment that is more favorable and would have supported me, but I chose not to tell anybody because it's not for anyone else to know. It's not. No one knew I was pregnant. Nobody knew I had the procedure done. I didn't want to talk about it. It's my story and I'll tell it when I want to tell it. Mm -hmm. And now what you've done in this country is yes, companies are offering to pay for women to go. You can go with a partner, whatever it is, but so what, now you want me to go and talk to HR and tell my manager and I have to go through this process for something that already is so personal? Mm-hmm. I don't understand the situation that we forced women to go into. Agreed. The only thing that makes me feel a little bit better about my daughter, and I'm saying this from a place of self-interest, is she's so young. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it would break my heart every single day right now that she is in a place, and it still does. I, being honest, I try not to think about it as much as I can right now because mm-hmm. it's so painful. Mm-hmm. God forbid my daughter gets older and she makes a mistake. Right. One time, in my situation, I wanted the child. But seriously, forbid she makes a mistake one time. And for the rest of her life now, she has to change everything because she had this child. Mm -hmm. What is that? Right. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Right. Right. Now, I'm not saying I'm pro-abortion. Right, where people can go and use it as a form of birth control. Right. Having said that, we're human. Things happen. We live in a developed society. Mm -hmm. Again, where if someone makes a mistake or if something happens outside of their control, Mm -hmm. someone gets raped, something happens, you're going to force that child to have another child? Right. Like, listen, my whole position on it is just don't control my body yeah that's it but cut and dry 
Yeah. Like, you know, like you said, I'm somebody else's baby too. Yeah. You know, just don't, I don't, I don't personally think that the government, yeah. our leaders should have a say in what we do with our bodies. You yeah. know, I just don't. And I think that's a dangerous, slippery slope yeah. that we begin to ride in a world that is just looking so different from, you know, years past and what our, our, our parents or our mothers or our fathers um, were a part of. And I just, I really think it's, it's hard. And I think that, you know, it's hard also because on one end, you're telling us that women are, are not, their opinions aren't valued for even their own bodies. The decisions they make for even their own bodies are not valued. But on the other end, you are seeing us strive and thrive and be so successful in so many other areas, um, I, I don't know, of life. And I think that's just a hard, it's a hard line that, like you said, that we're having to teach our, our young women our daughters. Um, I just think it's a dangerous one. And it is. And I just want to reiterate one point you said I really like is it's, it's an, and to a certain extent, it's showcasing that our opinions aren't valued. That's right. One is it's our body, but number two, also it's our opinion of how things should go. And it's, it starts to then put a different type of a bias towards women in general, mm -hmm. which now is a domino effect, which impacts so many other aspects of our life. I, I really like what you just said. No, I, I do. And, you know, as raising two girls, I just think that it's, a, it's something I think about a lot. And you know what else? Raising a son. You know, raising a son too, because I personally, I love the fact that I get to raise a young man in this world. I love it. I love the fact that I have an influence yeah. on how this young man will view women and view the value of women, yeah. you know, and I hope, I hope to God that I am able to impart that and his sisters as well into this man that is very similar to my husband, just respects women, respects their right and appreciates their value in this world. And I just think it's a powerful thing. I don't know. This, and that's what motherhood is all about, right? I mean, that's what parenthood is all about. Yeah. It's, it's about being able to impart those values into a younger generation. Yeah. But let's move forward. So fast forwarding, we've, we've done all that. You know, now we have babies. Now we have a career. <laughs> I want to talk about relationship because, you know, I think that is a big thing that, you know, we as mothers, um, or, or just, I'll just say as women, as just busy people, I'll just say that. Let's be a little more general, right? As busy people, sometimes mm -hmm. we get so like caught up in our day to day, we get caught up in our careers, we get caught up in our kids, we get caught up, whatever it is that sometimes keeping relationship, especially through all of the things that we're doing, can be challenging. Yeah. So what are some ways, first of all, tell me, you and your husband have been together for a very long time. Yes, yes. So we've been <laughs> together for 15 years, uh, married for five. Ah, so very similar. My husband and I, we've been together for probably like, um, let me do the math on this. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> I feel like we've been married for like 12 years. Oh, wow. But we, we'll, so we've been together for like 17. Ah. Wait a minute, is that right? 12 years we've I been like married? Every time you say like, I don't know. I'm so confused now. We got married in 2009. <laughs> let's do the math. 2009. Hold on. Let's do the math. What is that? 2009. That's 19. 19. That's, That's yeah, 13. 13. Okay, so we've been together for 17 years. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, we were so together for a good like amount of time. Yeah, yeah. So same, so similar. Yeah, yeah. But for us, I feel like I get like, so I love to hear about other people who have been in relationships for long periods of time too. Yeah. Because you kind of grow up with this person in many respects, right? Yeah. Like you go through so many transitions and changes. And I know for us, that's the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge for us is always growing together, but also individually. So have you guys mastered that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I want to talk to her. I know. <laughs> okay. It's, um, I mean, that is such a great question because I wonder if it's, or I think it's essentially, you know, you... You grow and then you have challenges, you gotta come back together. You grow and then you have challenges, you have to come back together. I don't ever think it's a direct path and it's just all sorted, mm, right? I love that. And so one of the things my husband and I always talk about is both of our careers are, we're both very ambitious type A people. We met in business school, right? And yeah. so we're, we're both on a trajectory where we wanna succeed and we wanna just do 
amazing things, whatever the success is, it looks like, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I love that though, because you understand each other. Yes, we do. I love that. We really do. And so both of us had conversations, first of all, before we got married. We were very clear on setting the intentions for our relationship of what we are and who's going to be doing what. Mm. Now, before you got married. Before we got married. Oh, that's real talk. Right? That's real talk right there. You, that's, ha you have to. That's a little nugget right there. <laughs> that's, that's pretty, you know what it is? That's pretty, um, one, very intuitive, um, but also very mature you know what i mean like i think to set that intention before you get married that's everything it is and the thing about that also that you have to remember is that it has to be reset at times mm, I like so that. if we move if we're having children if different things go on we have those conversations if and life if, happens which it there does. you go because life lifes that's right it's always lifing type yeah, of a right. deal right and so now back to the thing with our careers we both have an understanding and agreement that we are going to be a seesaw, oh. right? So you know you see Explain the seesaws that. Break on the- Break it down, break the seesaw <laughs> down, break it down. You see the seesaws on the kids' playground, right? Where it's at one point in time, one person's career or job is gonna be moving a little faster and someone's gonna have to take care of more of the things. We call it, my husband's last name is Philantris, so we call it the philantrisco.com, right? I love it. Hey! Cool, cool mom. Mom. <laughs> I love it, I love it, right? Okay, go ahead. And so it's, it's our corporation, essentially. And so at certain times, I'm gonna have to take the lead in certain things at home, or he's gonna have to take the certain leads, but we're moving back and forth. And I think the misnomer is, is that back in the day, it was you had to have one parent who has the career and is the breadwinner, and the other one is taking care of things at home. Mm -hmm. Now, in the modern day, you can have two people that are go, 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 and as much as we wanna believe that you can always be go, 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 when kids come in the mix, it changes everything, changes as you everything. know. It does, the whole dynamic shift. Shift. And so, what we've done is we alternate. Now, we constantly have to have conversations, and it isn't even like one year one person takes more over the other. It could be one week somebody's taking more over the other. Okay, but what, a, what does a conversation like that look like? And how do you choose if you're both go, 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 and it sounds like you guys are both on this trajectory, right, where you're constantly moving, growing, thriving, all these things. Do you choose which one kind of like we ha does we have the seesaw? to yeah we have to and it's a choice and so one big thing that happened is we sold the company i was at while i was pregnant mm. my husband took off nine weeks of paternity leave wow i didn't take off a day he took off nine weeks wow it would not have worked for us if he didn't do that it takes a village it takes wow. a life team right that is amazing it really it is and it's it's constant communication. I can't reiterate that enough. So no, so but I hear that through all like through a lot of marriages, right? It's all about communication. I mean, yes. I feel like that in mine too. When I I know we're doing great and we're in a great rhythm when communication is flowing. Yeah. And it's so hard because you forget sometimes that when something changes, you need to redo that conversation or you mm -hmm. need to restate it right. and it's very important now it could be life happens mm -hmm. it can also be something in your career changes so my husband recently just had some great news at work and so now it's this morning actually we just had a conversation and the thing i think about conversations when you have kids is that it's not going to be a formal time you get to sit down and no, have a conversation. It's, it's like in passing, someone's using the bathroom, right. getting ready. It's like, all right, let's go. Let's During have this breakfast, conversation. exactly. Yeah, right? While someone's brushing the kids' teeth, right. you have the conversation in passing. And so that's how we have them, but it constantly has to keep reoccurring. So right now my husband came to me. We're looking at the school year right now for fall for my three-and-a-half-year-old. Mm -hmm. And he said, listen, I'm... a challenge in itself. A, a whole challenge within itself. <laughs> okay. And now he said to me, you know, this fall we need to think about something and might have to rearrange things because my travel schedule is probably going to pick up more. And I said, well, that doesn't work for me. And so then we said, listen, what are some possible solutions of how we can restructure it? I'm very big on putting an infrastructure in place oh, I love so this. that once you have the infrastructure in place, you can move forward with more confidence. Wow. Right? I love it. And you're upfront about it from the beginning. You guys are like talking about it. You're upfront about it. So everyone is clear going into it what is expected of each one. Yeah. And the thing is, you might not always be happy <laughs> yeah. about what the other person has Welcome to, to marriage. <laughs> Welcome to marriage. Yeah, Touche. Yeah. So Welcome true. Welcome to marriage. So true. You might not always be happy about what they say, but you need to have those conversations. And the way I look at that, and this isn't business or marriage or anything, it's almost a, 
bad versus worse. Mm -hmm. So having the conversation could be bad and it's gut wrenching and you don't want to do it, but it's worse if you don't have it Mm -hmm. and things just dwindle off. I love that. Right. And they're just left up to happenstance and chance. Well, yeah, it's funny. I mean, you know, even just speaking about like, and I hate to say it, but like even divorce, right? It doesn't just pop up out of anywhere. It's like, I was talking to someone recently. It's, it's the, it's the death by a thousand cuts, right? It's the constant, not bringing things up, having things sit, not talking about things, not bring it to the forefront or, or to the surface and, you know, having the conversations, right? I think that's what a lot comes to her. But I I love the seesaw method yeah. because naturally in a marriage you are going to have some people you know one person who's doing a little bit you know higher than and lower and then one and I love the whole idea of you know taking turns and yeah. knowing when those flows the ebbs and flows of life are yeah. happening with your partner it's so important and are there times and this is where I think you were what you were alluding to earlier is are there times where both of us are going to want to be there and right. sometimes you don't have a choice because of how things are at work or opportunities that come your way absolutely but it needs to be a conversation because mm-hmm. that's the point where we can start to say who else can we include in the picture and what could it look like and I think the biggest thing Lizzie is is doing your best it's not always easy but doing your best to withhold emotion Mm. don't make this about me or you or right or wrong but it's just structure right right what could this look like who could take care of the kids is there somebody else that we can pull in for parts of it are there other resources that we can deploy are there things that we can do like for example if it was making the children's food Mm -hmm. that's the hard thing that's a tough one can we get food from somewhere else? Are there delivery services that we can use? What are the different things we can into put into play? Right. But it's all about evaluating the structure. And then here's my you always accounting finance background is you want to do a cost benefit analysis, right? right? What's right. going to make the most sense financially? Yeah. And then you figure things out collectively. And the thing, Lizzie, too, is that it is hard to have these conversations, mm-hmm. but to the extent that you can, you want to make it fun. Because this is a journey. Right. That you're going through together. Exactly. And as you said, we've been together with our respective partners for such a long time. We've seen the other person grow. We've gone through different stages of life. And this is the next one. And this is a hard one. Right. With kids. Right. With kids. Yeah. But you know, as you're talking, the thing that is literally like a, a, a highlight in my brain, it's literally going, it's like flashing as if it's like in neon letters, is... That you said, listen, we are a corporation. And it's so true. And I think that, you know, when you take the emotion out of it, like, oh, I love him so much, or I love her so much, and I've been with this person for so long, and you really think about just the dynamic of, you know, um, how a business is run, Mm -hmm. and you think of yourselves and your family as that, and, and just the aspect of it, I think that's where the efficiency comes in, yeah. right? You're like, okay, I need to get this done, this done, this done, this done, and this is how we're going to do it. And this is, you're so like, you know, you can be so structured with it in that aspect. But I think there's something about that that um, brings out an efficiency in communication, yeah. in in a relationship. So I love the fact that you said, you know, you framework. We listen. We are the corporation. Yep. Yeah. And that's cool. That's cool. I, I like I can relate to that yeah. because that makes sense in my brain. I love right? it. So I always tell my husband, like, we're the corporation, though we have the income generating assets, right? So we right. can say it's my husband and I. Right. Then we have <laughs> the outflows of cash, so the children, the <laughs> nanny, the childcare, all the things that takes all the money out, right, right? Right. But we actually just look at it as a business. Yes. And so that's where you start to say, okay, there's certain time periods where my career is going to have certain things that are going to come up, and then mm-hmm. from a decision making standpoint. You look at the quantitative and then you look at the qualitative. And the reason from an emotional standpoint with my husband, I do the quantitative first Mm -hmm. is because the qualitative a lot of times is subjective and Mm. people make it personal. I feel like this would be nice. You hear that all the time, right? With quantitative, it's easy. Numbers, math, right? right. It's it's binary. There's a zero or a one. How much are you making? What is something bringing in? What is an opportunity worth to you? Mm. So from a decision-making standpoint, first you do the quantitative then you add in the qualitative component. Mm -hmm. And I have found that actually makes conversations Mm -hmm. with my husband even, or my family members, it makes it much easier because you don't 
bring emotions in normally when you're looking at the quantitative. You're bringing in facts. Ex- exactly. These are facts. And I am all about the facts. 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 No, I think it's great. I mean, you make me want to go do like I'm literally a flow chart right now. Like I just <laughs> really just want to like stop what we're doing and go do a flow chart. Okay, but coming into all of this, right? Like from the family corporation to, you know, kids and, and career and all that stuff like that. Do you and your husband through this, right? And through all of like the structure, how do you guys find time for yourselves? Like, how do you date? Do you date or do you, what do you do? (laughs) I mean, that is a great question. And probably it is a point right now with the both of us too, because I always want more time with him. Mm. I want my time. I want attention. So you're all the of one. That. You're yes. the one. There's usually one in the relationship That's who's me. like, I want more. I want more. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. That is absolutely me. Um, and that's also where it's, you know, I just think it's important to keep saying these things if it is something that you want. And mm-hmm. I, I keep saying it, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, but I, I do think that we find the time in our own way. And my the way my husband and I find time is going to look different than your husband and yours and well, somebody else's. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And I think the challenge a lot of times is people will look at this, and even I'll be subject to this, is I'll hear everybody talk about, oh, you should do a date night once a week or this or that, and then I'll start harping on my husband. I'll acknowledge it. And I'll say, you're not doing this with me. This isn't happening, right? But what does we, it look like for you? We create it in our own way. So, for example, next week, we're actually going um, to one of our friends from business school. is mm-hmm. having a joint bachelorette and bachelor party in Cabo. Nice. And so we're going without the kids from Wednesday to Sunday. Love it. And it's just my husband and I. And we're actually going a couple days before the larger group comes there. Nice. So we'll do our own time. We're staying at a different hotel for a couple days. And we'll go have fun, mm-hmm. go for drinks, enjoy each other's company, all the fun stuff. You right? make the time. You make Make the time. We make the time, but we're making the, the reason I want to point this out is, and this comes back to, you said we give people advice, but we don't always take it. And I need to take this advice myself here is that how it looks like where you're creating that time for you and your spouse, your spouse, your partner is going to look different than anybody else is doing it. And we should not create standards or benchmarks compared to how other people are. Because I actually just had this conversation with my husband this morning that he doesn't spend any time with me. My birthday is right around the corner. And he was saying, well, what do you want to do? And I said, listen, all I want, I just want more time with you. Mm. And so I also need to be mindful of that, that we do spend time but it's different in the way that other people might do it. Well, listen, I mean, I think that's actually just a good um, tip and a good kind of statement to make across the board, especially in a world right now where social media is so prevalent and we're constantly on our phones, we're constantly trying to find ways to share or absorb or whatever information from other people, that you can't compare your relationship or yourself or your career or your children or any of these things to, to what you see and what you hear from your friends. I think everyone's journey is different. And yeah. I think that's the beauty in all of it. And I think that actually is, is that really does cover what you just said. Everyone's journey is different in all the aspects that we've talked about. And it could be right after you have birth. Mm-hmm. What is your journey going to be with you know, you have a first kid or a second kid. How do things look like? How does your work journey go? And I think the most important thing that resonates to me, and it's a constant reminder also, is I need to create my own journey mm-hmm. for what I want, not what anybody else wants or what anyone else thinks it needs to look like. That's right. And honestly, Lizzie, I love my journey. I love it too. I love that I had my son and I was able to go back to work and be mm-hmm. successful at what I do. I love that I had the second child and he was there with me. Even if he didn't come out into this world, he was my child Mm -hmm. for that short period of time. And I love him. Mm -hmm. And I love that I had my third pregnancy, right? My daughter. And I love that I had to have her during this time where I was going through and selling a company and everything else that we were doing after, I love that they're a part of my life and that's my journey Mm -hmm. and I get to embrace it. And for some reason, so many moms feel guilty instead of just embracing and owning it. That's right. And if I could tell any other mom out there who's a young mom, who's a couple steps behind me where their kids are in age, it's own it and love it and embrace it. You will not get this time back with your children 
and you will not get this time back of who you are. Mm -hmm. So however it's going to look for you, do it that way and love it. That's right. You know, honestly, I could not even say it better and I couldn't end this podcast on a better note, to be honest with you. I think the idea of loving your journey, that's it right there. Love your journey, no matter what it looks like, own it because it only belongs to you. And you know what? It's a good looking one, no matter what it looks like, because regardless, you're learning, you're growing, you know what I mean? And you're, you're getting to that next step. Regardless, as long as you're living, my mama used to say, as long as you're living, you're taking one step in front of the other. Own your journey and love it. And I love the fact that you're so true to who you are and owning your journey, that you're inspiring others, women, mothers, fathers, men, what, whoever it is to do the exact same. And I couldn't, I literally can't, I can't even express that enough. Thank you, you are Nuha, most for welcome. being here. I mean, honestly, I could. This is so amazing to me. I'm so glad that you have such a busy schedule. That I'm so glad that I was able to to have this conversation with you. And I hope everyone out there. I hope you gained as much insight and information and true inspiration from from you as much as I have. Because I'm so inspired by you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Lizzie. All right, guys. The next Cool Mom Code podcast coming soon your way. Bye.